You know, there was a time when Thor was considered a total lame whose main defining feature was that he was hot. Thor out there, he's waving his hammer around and everything. Very serious, had a hammer, and was treated more as a prop. There to give gravitas and deeper dramatic context to the plot. It is a signal to all the realms that the Earth is ready for a higher form of war. A higher form? In Avengers 1, he represented Asgard in the wider universe. In Age of Ultron, he runs off to advertise the next film. But then, with Ragnarok and the Thanos duology, it seemed like they cracked the code. He became a fan favorite and everyone cheered, cried and laughed for him. However, then there was Love and Thunder. And I don't really think people were ready for what happened. As a result, the story of Thor is a story of shifting genres where balance was searched, found, and then it directly leads to the fall. So if you die, you'll end up in Valhalla. Oh my god, go away. But first, what is the purpose of genre? Film scholar Graham Turner argued, what genre does is recognize that the audience watch any one film within a context of other films. This aspect of genre intertextuality polices the boundaries of an audience's expectations. It can tell them what to expect. I like this definition a lot because it recognizes the social side of genres. Genre is not a fixed set of properties we use to identify what type of film something is, but it's also the relationship between the audience and the artist. Is there a renaissance fair in town? However, this is also where the more problematic side exists. Genre is also tied to branding, because it's a way for the business to target different market sectors and create production stability when it comes to predicting audience expectations. As a result, it can throttle creativity, as argued by Christine Gladhill. Thor films are weird because they're all over the place in terms of genre branding, largely because as a character, he's an overlap of different genres. Thor is a fantasy superhero who comes from a fantasy setting, but he also fights supervillains in New York City with his superpowered superhero friends. His central iconography in characters, props, costume and settings is a bricolage of various other stuff. As a result, back in phase one, he was the toughest egg to crack when it comes to introducing him in a genre that can be understandable for the audience and have a place within the market. He's a whole mixture of things, you know, he's sexy, he's... Is it a fantasy film? Is it a superhero film? Whichever genre leans into the most, it becomes a promise that has to be satisfied because that is what the film will be marketed by. Is the excitement all about seeing a dude fighting in a city or about a rich fantasy world lore and stuff? Thor 1 tried to marry the two with sheer awe as a Kenneth Branagh Shakespearean drama where there's little action and the focus is more on the opera of jealousy and secrets destroying a family. Can I come up? Then Dark World is less of a superhero film and became more of an Alan Taylor fantasy epic that's focused on the politics of different places and their histories. We will fight! Then finally, the Thor film settled in the Taika Waititi absurdist comedy. Well, not any longer. That's high on improv and 80s rock music. So instead of trying to marry the two worlds of drama and serious romance, it was all about laughing at it to make it work. And the weird thing about it is that Ragnarok, despite its totally different visuals and tone, is a more consistent sequel to Thor 1 than Dark World, because under its appearances are themes and characters that are more relevant to the themes of Thor 1, and that's because Ragnarok and Thor 1 are stories about integration, and Dark World is about order. It's important to stress that genres run far deeper than appearances or consumer promises. They are tied to different core messages. As Levi Strauss argued, storytelling gives us imaginative solutions for fundamental contradiction and unreasonable difficulties of a society. And Schatz identified two lanes genres broadly provide solutions through. In genres of orders, you know, like mainly action films, heroes, usually individuals, are in a setting that's ideologically unstable. The conflict is often externalized and expressed through violent action, and therefore, the resolution is elimination. The themes are presented through the hero taking upon themselves to fix the problem and solve the contradictions inherent in their society. The realms need their old father strong and unchallenged, whether he is or not. But he's blinded, Heimdall, by hatred and by grief. As are all your. Well, I see clearly enough. 
Dark World fits into this extremely smoothly. Odin is an angry, unstable, weak leader, and it's through Thor's macho behaviour in departing that he gets to become the redeemer of his society. One son who wanted the throne too much, another who will not take it. Is this my legacy? However, that's not the values endorsed in Thor 1, because that and Ragnarok stems from genres of integrations, which are musical, comedies, and melodramas. Where in contrast, the hero is a couple or a collective, like a family, or in this case, brothers, with fully well-realized arcs. They're in a setting that's a civilized space or is ideologically unstable. Ragnarok is a bit off here. The conflict, as a result, is more internalized through emotion. So the resolution is embrace and love. Therefore, the themes are presented through the couple or family integrating into the wider community. Thor 1 may end with a fight between Thor and Loki, but the physical is not the resolution. It's actually Odin telling his son to stop, and it's in this moment of shame, but also embrace that Loki does stop. While in Ragnarok, Loki returns to save his brother, and they both accept their responsibility in looking after their people. I'm here. Thor 1 and Ragnarok fundamentally endorses oppositional messages to Dark World. This is especially felt with the characters and how their narrative roles twist their personalities to fit with the ideologies of the story. If I had not taken you in, you would not be here now to hate me. To this day, I still remember gasping when Odin addressed Loki as equally as Thor, because after Dark World, I had gotten so used to him hating on his son and Anthony Hopkins doing a completely different performance. This is my birthright. Your birthright! Where he's whispering like a sinister snake that I wasn't really ready for an emotional close-up of Loki's reaction and Odin speaking with the same wise demeanor from before. My sons, I've been waiting for you. So without any words, Waititi's direction pays off Thor 1 more than Dark World, What's where the kid who was so insecure about not being loved sincerely and is ready to be shouted at gets choked up when it doesn't happen. Now, one could argue in Dark World, Odin was still heated about Loki's war on Midgard and is still probably grouchy from waking up earlier. Thor must strive to undo the damage you have done. But there's no line Thor has about his father changing. Instead, it feels like it's self retconning Human lives are fleeting, they're nothing. You'd be better served by what lies in front of you. Everyone acts like it's normal, and we're supposed to believe these new personalities has always been around. This is because Odin has to be different between films, in a genre that endorses communal integration. As a mentor figure, he has to be a wise, patient, loving father. In a genre that endorses individual order, he has to be an established, unstable figure that Thor can defy. Otherwise, his agency in bringing order won't have meaning or place in a society's short Well, I'm I know very well who you are, Jane Foster. And how many of our men shall fall on there? As many as are needed! You've opened these peaceful realms and innocent lives to the horror and desolation of war! And how are you different from Malika? <laughs> the difference, my son, is that I will win. There will never be a wiser king than you. Thor himself is also really different. In Thor 1, he is a funny guy who happily talks about the tales of his friends, smashing cups, enthusiastically tells Jane everything like a kid. Yes. Thor is a warm figure of community there, but Dark World, he's a reluctant hero. This isn't about Jane Foster, father. He's not entirely satisfied with the people he's with, and is so serious that he rarely fucking smiles. Out of alignment, and then the connection is lost. But then in Ragnarok, he's a cheerful adventurer again, who loves telling stories and loves making friends. He has no individual wants, he just wants to help and tend to his community. Ah, Loki! Similarly with Loki, the idea that he just sits around with plays of himself, eating cherries, was clearly not what Dark World's super sinister final sting was promising. It's clear that the genre rule set up meant that we're going to see him cause real serious chaos, and Thor would have to once again redeem an even more chaotic world. But that promise is not characteristically relevant with the Loki from Thor 1, where all he ever wanted was acceptance. And even when he was king, he He had no deeper political ambitions than being smug, defensive, and insecure. Why have you done this? To prove to father that I am a worthy son. The point I'm trying to make here is that genre rules run far deeper than visual indicators, and Ragnarok is f***ing awesome, which is why Love and Thunder is, um... <laughs> it's a little, uh, hot and... starting to feel 
is claustrophobic. Genre of integration is themed around resolving personal antagonisms, building community and cooperation, while genres of order is themed around individual heroes who don't assimilate the values slash lifestyle of the community they save, but maintains their individuality. Where does four four or four fits in? It stays in integration, thankfully. It's a story about learning to live in the moment, regardless of the end, and not to project your dreams and hopes onto others, but be the hero you seek. Be the hero for your people. Gore's hatred and villainy stems from being forgotten and thrown aside by his god, but Thor, after gaining the power of his disappointing hero, uses it to include and bestow the children of Asgard with his power, which resembles the life of Tree. Gore resurrects his child as opposed to follow with his vengeance. Jane dies saving the children. So as much as stories are worshipped, offers hopes, dreams and reasons to live, it's not about submitting to them, but holding on to the ability to write for yourself. As grief, trauma and even eventual death from cancer shouldn't interrupt one's ability to live in the moment and invest in the children. Ever since I picked up that hammer, it's like I've gotten an extra life. It was magical. And the fact that Thor looks after Gore's daughter after his own love died is the ultimate symbol of this, and further expands with the ideas from all that was before. Just as Odin adopted Loki, the baby of an enemy, Thor does the same. This is all nice, but it's hard to be entirely invested because the film doesn't nurture these ideas. I don't want to talk about the temple. I, I know, but if we were to talk about it, I think it's important to. It's making me sad. Material object. Because it's so busy diluting itself with improv that, unlike Ragnarok, is consistently irrelevant. For example, in Ragnarok, Loki watched a play of himself, which recapped the previous films in a very funny way, but. It also contributed to creating a greater satisfying transformation because it displayed very much how much he wants to be accepted. That melted this old fool's heart. How much he wants to believe his father loves him. So when he does, unexpectedly receives it, it's touching. The majority of Ragnarok's jokes, even if it was improv, was focused in developing a story about acceptance and how stories can hide lies but also create bonds. Whereas Love and Thunder tends to just, why not? Which, as a result, it gambles. And this time, it dealt very little reward. When we have the theatre recap, it's just there as a recap. There's no deeper character element to it. When Valkyrie takes out portable music player, it's just there, cause... Ahhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhh
it's cool that Marvel is taking risks and experimenting with their style so it's less homogenous, especially when the TV shows are actively more and more standardized now, but they've done it in such an extremely careless way that it's become almost counterproductive to an extent. <laughs> I'm gonna beat you so badly with that cup of water behind you. Spider string, 